Hours program coming to you from the Kansas Museum of History. As always, the program will be followed by a question and answer period with our presenter. Please use the Q&A link at the bottom of the screen to post your questions and we'll get to as many as we can. Tonight, we are joined by New York Times bestselling author, Andrew Moranis, to speak about his recent publication, Games of Deception. His first book, Strong Inside, Perry Wallace and the Collision of Race in Sports in the South, received several awards, including the 2015 Lillian Smith Book Award for Civil Rights. The American Library Association named the Young Readers Edition of Strong Inside one of the top 10 biographies for youth in 2017. Moranis is coming to us from Nashville, Tennessee, where it is a little bit warmer than here, where he is a visiting author at Vanderbilt University's Athletics, a contributor to ESPN's TheUndefeated.com and a commentator for numerous national media programs. I might add, that if his name is familiar, aside from his body of work, his father is David Moranis, a Pulitzer Prize winning author and associate editor for the Washington Post. So I think there's a strong writing gene in this family. Moranis' book, Games of Deception, is a remarkable true story of the birth of the Olympic basketball game at games at the 1936 Summer Games in Hitler's Germany. It chronicles the incredible story of one of the world's most popular games. We know that being Kansans. He tells of the key figures who made the historic event possible, including players from McPherson, Kansas. More than a standard sports book, this is also a story of racism and anti-Semitism on both sides of the Atlantic and a secret propaganda campaign by German and American Olympic officials to ensure US participation in these controversial games. The lessons in this book are as relevant today as they were 80 years ago. It is now my pleasure to welcome Andrew Marinas. Thank you, Mary. Uh, this is a real pleasure uh, to have this opportunity. Um, I wish I were in Kansas. I know, of course, that's not possible, but um, I, I loved all of the time that I spent in Kansas when I was researching uh, this book. And when it came out last November, uh, I drove through uh, a snowstorm and an ice storm from Nashville through St. Louis uh, to Kansas and had a chance to launch the book in McPherson and in Lawrence and DeSoto um, and then over in uh, Kansas City as well. So uh, this is my first time to talk to some uh, Kansas audiences since then, and there's no more uh, appropriate audience for this book than people in Kansas, because as you mentioned, half the first US Olympic basketball team came from uh, McPherson. James Naismith, who I'll talk a lot about tonight, uh, was the athletic director at KU at the time. Fog Allen, legendary basketball coach at Kansas, was the person most responsible for basketball even being in the Olympics in the first place. And the idea to write this book came while I was visiting Lawrence. So uh, all sorts of Kansas connections. And let me um, share my screen here as I walk through the presentation. So I wanted to show everyone a picture here. The old picture is my great grandfather, Andrew Cummins, who was the father of my grandmother, Mary Marinus. Um, and he was from Cocker City, Kansas. And he ran track uh, at Kansas at a time when the athletic director there was James Naismith. I didn't really realize this connection to my own book, <laughs> uh, my own family, until I got started writing this book. And one of my um, uh, sort of second cousins sent me this picture of Andrew Cummins when he was a, a runner uh, at Kansas. And I, don't, I was telling Mary earlier, I don't know what happened to the speed genes in our family, I certainly could not be on any sort of college track team, but my great grandfather was. Um, you see the picture here, those of you who have been to McPherson have seen the mural that celebrates the 1936 uh, US Olympic basketball team and the McPherson Refiners AAU team. 
that made up half of that first uh, dream team at the Olympics. And then some pictures here uh, from that launch in Kansas that I remember so fondly at the Raven Bookstore in Lawrence and then uh, at Lexington Trails Middle School with their librarian, Nikki, uh, who became a great friend through this whole experience. Um, but I, again, I have great memories of Kansas and even have some history, family history with the, with the Cocker City connection with my great grandfather. Uh, this is me back when I was uh, about 12, 13 years old. We lived outside of Washington, D.C. in Silver Spring, Maryland, and I played uh, baseball back then and, and loved sports. I was the type of kid that really looked forward to Sports Illustrated magazine arriving in the mailbox every week. My grandparents, Elliot and Mary Marinus, lived in Milwaukee uh, at the time, and they were trying to uh, brainwash me into liking the same teams that they did, right? So the, the Milwaukee Brewers and the Green Bay Packers, they subscribed me to Packer Report magazine and What's Brewing magazine. And, and I was reading a lot as a kid and it was all about sports, you know? And so when I speak to students, I tell them really the most important thing is just to read whatever you're interested in. It doesn't matter if, you, if it's not the most serious topic in the world. The whole point is just to become a, a lover of, of books and newspapers and magazines and, and reading you know, and become a lifelong reader. And so I tried to start my own sports magazine. Uh, this is AJ's Sports Journal. My middle name is James. So AJ Sports Journal, where I created my own little version of Sports Illustrated. You can see at the bottom, I tried to sell it for $1.75. Uh, nobody bought it. And so I still have this magazine, but you know, that was my introduction to writing about sports. Uh, two years later, in 1985, we moved to Austin, Texas, and I went to high school at Austin High and played baseball there and was the sports editor of our high school newspaper. And uh, one day at the school, there was a poster on the wall, and it was advertising a scholarship to Vanderbilt here in Nashville, and it was a scholarship for high school sports writers. It was named after Grantland Rice, who some of you may have heard of, a legendary uh, sports writer in the early 1900s. He's the one who wrote, it's not whether you win or lose, but how you play the game. Um, and Fred Russell, who was a local um, well-known sports editor here in Nashville for over 50 years. And this was a full tuition scholarship uh, to Vanderbilt. I'd, I'd never heard of uh, Vandy before. I'd never been to Nashville before, but it was full tuition. So I applied for the scholarship. And uh, a couple months later, uh, my mom and my little sister showed up at the school and my mom was crying. I didn't know why she was there. And my fourth grade daughter now talks about happy tears. And it was happy tears that Vandy had called and said that I had won this scholarship. And so that's why I ended up here in Nashville. And one of the first stories that I learned at my new school was the story of Perry Wallace. And Mary mentioned my first book, Strong Inside. Um, but my interest in Perry started well before I wrote the book. It started when I was a teenager, uh, 19 years old. My sophomore year at Vanderbilt was the first year that Perry, whose sister, I believe, uh, I can't see who's on the Zoom tonight, but Jesse Wallace Jackson and his sister, I believe, is, is watching tonight. I wanted to say hi to uh, Miss Jesse. Um, this was the first time that Perry was ever invited back to Vanderbilt for making history as the first African American basketball player in the Southeastern Conference. And this was 20 years after he had graduated as the Jackie Robinson of the SEC, but the school you know, um, never invited him back to celebrate that moment. And they finally did uh, a sophomore. I learned about the history he had made, the courage that he had, the death threats that he endured. Um, and so I was taking history class at the time and didn't know that it was Perry and um, classmates of his in the 1960s who had created these black history classes at Vanderbilt um, that was taught by this woman here, Dr. Yolette Jones. And I asked Dr. Jones if it would be okay if I wrote a paper about Perry for her class. And I really thought that she would say no. You know, I was concerned she was gonna say, we don't write about sports. That's not a serious enough uh, academic subject. And thankfully she had the same attitude that William Zinser, you can see his quote here about no topic is stupid. If you're interested in it, you know, you'll probably do a good job. She said, go for it. And so I called Perry from my dormitory uh, 
uh, just a cold call. He answered. We spoke for two or three hours that very first time. And it was the most interesting thing that I did uh, as a college student and became so fascinated with, with Perry's story. Here's the paper I wrote about him. It wasn't a book that I first read about Perry. It was a term paper in college with a handwritten <laughs> cover. But 17 years later, uh, in 2006, his story was still in my mind. And I, I emailed him. He was by then a professor uh, at American University Law School, a colleague of uh, Congressman Raskin, who you may have seen in the impeachment hearings, good friend of Perry's. Um, and I emailed Perry and asked him if uh, he'd be okay if I wrote a biography about him. And of course, you don't have to ask your subject for their permission, but I wanted to know that Perry would cooperate and you know, introduce me to his family and, and share stories and pictures. And he said, go for it. Um, Mary mentioned my father who's written a number of books, but I guess I wasn't really paying attention. I, I didn't know uh, how long it might take to write a book. I thought maybe a year or two. It took me eight years to write Strong Inside. Uh, I spent four years on the research, four years on the writing. Uh, it finally came out in 2014. Two years later, I adapted it for middle school and high school students and have loved traveling around the country back when travel was possible, talking to students about this story of, of civil rights. Again, a story that's about basketball, but really about a lot more than that. Um, one of my trips on the Strong Inside tour was to Kansas. And some of you probably recognize the picture uh, behind me, or you don't recognize me, but you recognize the scene behind me in the picture on the left from the Dole Institute of Politics in Lawrence. I had a chance to uh, speak there about Strong Inside and about Perry Wallace. And while I was in town, it was my first time ever to Lawrence, I really wanted to see Allen Fieldhouse uh, just as a big college basketball fan. Um, and so I took a tour of the Fieldhouse and also of the DeBru Center right next door and saw this display in the middle, which is the original rules of basketball. I know that um, KU was in a big bidding war with Duke uh, in an auction to, to win these original pieces of paper where James Naismith um, wrote out the original rules of basketball, both schools wanting to claim to be the home of college basketball. And so of course, Kansas won. And I was really impressed with that exhibit. And the person showing me around said, did you rec realize that the inventor of basketball, James Naismith, um, was able to see his invention at the Olympics. And you see Naismith here with a Japanese player from the 1930s. And I, I didn't know that. And I asked, well, which Olympics was that? And when he said it was the 36 Olympics in Nazi Germany, I knew I had the subject for my next book, uh, standing there uh, in the De Bruce Center. And so the book uh, really sort of follows three major threads. And those are what I'll talk about tonight. The first is uh, Naismith himself, who was he? Uh, how did he invent this game? Why did he invent this game? Uh, the second theme is the, about the players. You know, I think people my generation would think of the U.S. Olympic basketball team, think of the dream team with Magic and Jordan and Larry Bird. Um, younger kids today think of LeBron and Carmelo Anthony and Kevin Durant. Uh, so who are these guys that were on the very first U.S. Olympic team and how was that team put together? And then the third and most important uh, thread in the book is about the state of the world at that time, what we can learn from it, what it was like to be an athlete in Hitler's Germany uh, during those Olympics. So here you see a sketch of the very first basketball game that was ever played. Uh, I found this when I was in Springfield, Massachusetts uh, at Springfield College which is where Naismith invented basketball. Uh, he was a young man who had grown up in Canada, uh, had attended college at McGill in Montreal and came down to Springfield to attend what was then called the YMCA training school, the international YMCA training school, which uh, attracted students from all over the world. Uh, it was just open to men at that point. Uh, and the purpose was to train these young men to go back out around the world and to run YMCAs. Uh, this was during a period uh, where uh, something called muscular Christianity uh, was gaining um, sort of attention and the idea that you know the best way to serve God was to develop your body uh, to the fullest. And so athletics, which had previously been seen as sort of a, a diversion or the devil's handiwork, you know, all of a sudden athletics was in fashion. And so these students at the school 
uh, would play baseball in the spring, they'd play football in the fall. But in the winter, in the snowy winters in Massachusetts, they didn't really have much to do. Uh, there was a gymnasium, but there were no basketball hoops in it yet, right? So they played uh, uh, tag and leapfrog. It sounded like kindergarten games when I was doing the research for this book. And so these, these young men were, were pretty bored with what the activities were in the winter. And so there was a professor named Luther Gulick who challenged his class uh, someone in the class to come up with a new game that they could play in the winter and that they could share with other wives uh, around the world. And so James Naismith uh, raised his hand as a student in that class and volunteered to accept this assignment to come up with a new game. Uh, like most students, he waited until the night before the assignment was due to work on it and invented basketball that night, the story goes, in December of 1891. And the very next morning, this game was played. And I, I think this picture is so fascinating because we don't know when the first baseball game was really played or the first football game or who was the first person to play tennis, you know, or when was the first game. But we actually have a sketch that we know is literally of the first basketball game ever played. It was done by a student from Japan who was there at the school. You see the custodian on the ladder. who's the one that nailed up the peach baskets, uh, why it's called basketball. Originally, they proposed this, the player, the students, who were playing Naismith's game and proposed naming it Naismith Ball, but he was too modest to accept that name. So they named it basketball after the peach baskets they were shooting the ball into. And the uh, reason that basketball hoops today are 10 feet off the ground, any court that you go to is because that's where the custodian nailed it, that very first basketball game. There was an elevated running track above the gym floor uh, at the school and it just happened to be 10 feet off the ground. He's up there on the ladder because they hadn't figured out yet to cut the bottom out of the basket. And so he had to climb up there every time they made a basket, which in that very first game was one time. <laughs> there was one basket made in that first game. Uh, the picture to the right, uh, you Jayhawk fans will recognize uh, Naismith with Fog Allen. And I mentioned him because, uh, and some of you may have heard this before, but Naismith called the father of basketball and Fog Allen's called the father of basketball coaching. Uh, he was the one that really elevated basketball from really a gym class activity that Naismith really saw as a way just for exercise during the winter. Fog Allen was really the first coach that envisioned basketball the way we think of it now as a spectator sport, uh, as a tournament sport. He's really responsible for the NCAA tournament, March Madness, um, and uh, a sport that people would pay to come watch. You know, um, he was the one that really pushed for basketball to be included in the Olympics. More than any other individual, I would say, in the world, it was Fog Allen uh, lobbying the International Olympic Committee. In 1932 in Los Angeles, you know, when the U uh, U.S. was hosting the Olympics, uh, was unsuccessful there. But he had a contact inside of Nazi Germany that really helped him succeed in getting uh, basketball included in 36. It was a, a man named Fritz Sawicki who as a young man had attended an American basketball camp. Uh, and Fog Allen was one of the instructors at that camp. Uh, when Hitler came to power and Germany won the Olympics in 36 prior to Hitler coming in. They won it in 32, Hitler wasn't in power till 33. Um, but Fritz Zwicky became an official in the Hitler Youth Organization. So he was an insider in the Nazi regime and Fog Allen stayed in touch with him and uh, worked with him to help lobby the German officials to include basketball for the very first time in the 36 Olympics. And when the uh, German Olympic organizers decided to include basketball, Fog Allen was the first person that they wrote in the United States and congratulating him for all the work that he had done over the years um, to get basketball in the Olympics. So then the question was, who's gonna play on this first US Olympic basketball team? And, you know, and the way that it's done now, um, players are essentially invited uh, to be on the team. There isn't much of too much of a tryout process, but you know, typically at a say at a high school or a college, uh, people might try out you know to be on the team as individuals. The way they did it back then in '36 was they had a tournament, and again, this is before the NCAA tournament. So this is really the first major national tournament of its kind, a uh, national tournament to determine who would represent the U.S. at the Olympics. They said whichever two teams advanced to the finals of this national tournament, those two rosters will be combined to become the US uh, Olympic basketball team. This tournament was only open to white teams 
So African-American teams were not eligible. Uh, the teams typically came from YMCA's, uh, from the AAU. Uh, and when we think of AAU, you know, now it's high school players that are being recruited by, you know, KU or K-State or Wichita State. But back then it was um, uh, players who had already graduated from college that were playing for company sponsored basketball teams. And then colleges were the third uh, major uh, provider of teams to this tournament. One of those two teams that advanced to the US finals at Madison Square Garden in New York came from McPherson, Kansas. There is the Globe Oil Refinery in McPherson that sponsored a basketball team as a way to promote uh, its gasoline um, and its other products. And uh, their coach, um, Coach Johnson was sort of considered uh, a very modern type of coach. I, I consider him almost like a, a Calipari type of coach. Maybe he wore um, fancy suits. He loved to talk. He was kind of a, a womanizer. You know, he was sort of a modern uh, college basketball type. They called themselves the tallest team in the world. They had players that were 6'7", 6'8". They described their brand of basketball as a uh, fire department basketball um, as if they were like uh, racing to a fire. They played so fast at a time when a lot of teams just slowly walked the ball up the court. Um, one notable thing about this team, you look, see the team picture here, the guy that's second from the right, Joe Fortenberry, is considered the first player ever to dunk the basketball uh, in a game. He did it at Madison Square Garden uh, in New York and uh, Arthur Daly, a New York Times sports writer, uh, had to figure out how to describe this unusual shot to his readers, no one had ever seen a dunk before, at least in New York. And so he said it looked like a customer at a coffee shop dunking their donut in coffee. And that's where the term dunk comes from, from uh, Joe Fortenberry, from a team from McPherson, Kansas. I have this picture of the donation ticket here. When they qualified to go to the Olympics, back then, you know, of course this is during the depression, um, there was no money to send the Olympians to Germany. And so they had to, they qualified, but there was no guarantee they were going to get there. They had to raise money just to get back to New York, to get back on the boat, to get to Germany. And so they sold essentially raffle tickets around town, door to door in McPherson. And so the town of McPherson felt a lot of pride in their team for going, but also a, a certain investment in the team because they had to basically pay for them to get to Germany. Now, the other half of the team came from a far different uh situation. They were from Hollywood. This was the team that also made it to the championship of the U.S. qualifying tournament to play the McPherson team. They came from Universal Pictures. Uh, the, bas or the basketball team Universal was created as a way to promote the movies of the movie studio. You know, they would travel around from town to town carrying this big Universal Pictures banner with them, their uniforms, you know, with Universal on it. And even more so than that, the man in the middle you see here, Jack Pierce, was the um, makeup artist at Universal, uh, a legendary makeup artist to, to movie uh, buffs. He created all the horror movie costumes that um, Universal was famous for back in those days, Dracula, Frankenstein, Hunchback of Notre Dame. He, and, uh, when you close your eyes and think of those characters, it was Pierce that came up with the looks for them. And he would uh, dress up the basketball players in those costumes, green makeup and all, you know, for Frankenstein's monster, uh, before games, they would come out and entertain the crowd uh, in these small towns in the 1930s and then change back into their basketball uniforms uh, and play a basketball game. So these were the, the two very best teams in the country that were combined to go to Berlin for the Olympics. Now, of course, there was a question of whether the United States should even participate in Olympics in Hitler's Germany. Uh, the boycott effort was much stronger than I had realized uh, until I got deep into the research. And I found pictures like this with more than 100,000 people marching through the streets of New York City to um, call for a boycott, to protest the idea of Olympics there. Um, this picture here of the basketball team at Long Island University, they were the best college team in the country at that point. They had won something like 36 games in a row heading into this uh, US qualifying tournament for the Olympics. And they took a vote as a team to boycott even the qualifying tournament. They had a handful of Jewish players on the team. It wasn't an all Jewish team, but the team voted unanimously um, to boycott the tournament. And so I thought it was important to recognize them 
in the book and I list their names, you know, they took a stand, but they've essentially been lost to history, uh, refusing to, um, to go to Berlin. Um, there's major uh, sort of rhetoric on both sides of the issue. Some people saying that, um, you know, sports and politics, they would say should be kept separate. Uh, these athletes had earned their right to uh, compete in the Olympics, uh, that, you know, athletes shouldn't be making these decisions anyway, politicians should. President Roosevelt refused to get involved. You know, there's always been sort of a hands-off relationship between the government and the uh, US Olympic team here, which is very different than the way other countries structure their Olympic teams. Um, Avery Brundage was the head of the American Olympic Committee as it was known then, and he was an anti-Semite. Um, I went to his uh, archives at the University of Illinois, saw all sorts of anti-Semitic uh, literature that he um, had kept, you know, for posterity's sake, magazines he was subscribing to, letters he was receiving. Uh, he was the biggest advocate for the U.S. continuing to participate in these Olympics and was actually coordinating with Nazi uh, propaganda officials to influence public opinion in the United States to ensure that, um, that we would uh, participate. The, the major decision came down to the AAU, uh, who controlled amateur athletics in the U.S. at that time, and they took a vote on whether we should go or not. And Brundage was working with Nazis to place articles in newspapers all around the country um, showing, quote unquote, the positive side of the Nazi regime. And, uh, and he was, of course, victorious. And we did participate in the 36 Olympics. Here's a picture of the SS Manhattan. Uh, when I talk to kids, I you know, say they, they didn't fly <laughs> to Germany for these Olympics. Uh, every uh, one on the US Olympic team, basketball and all the other sports uh, were on this same boat uh, for a, a long trip to Europe for the Olympics. And this is uh, seen on Jan July 15th, 1936, uh, about two weeks before the Olympics started. Um, read a lot of articles uh, about this scene at the pier in New York City and discovered one interesting thing. There was a, a man on the dock well, everybody else is celebrating. They described it as kind of like the 4th of July with people waving their American flags. The ship was red, white, and blue. There were bands playing patriotic music. But there was one protester there. His name was Richard Reuter, and he had been held uh, in, a, in a Nazi prison for almost a year and thought he would be executed. Uh, he was released, I think, as sort of a PR move ahead of the Olympics. And he comes back to the United States and he's trying to raise alarms about what's going on over there in Germany and uh, shows up uh, in New York at the pier to hold a banner that he had made that said boycott Nazi Germany land of darkness, boycott Hitler, keep America free for um, fight for race tolerance, democracy and peace. You know, and of course you could say that's what we did fight for in World War II, but of course it was too late at this time the ship goes sailing past Richard Reuter and the Statue of Liberty uh, on its way to Berlin. And this is the Berlin that the world arrived in uh, for the Olympics. Searching through photos uh, at the uh, US Holocaust Museum website and running across so many pictures that had the swastika and the Olympic rings, you know, side by side as if they belong together. You know, um, one reason the book is called Games of Deception is because the city of Berlin was really um, set up as a facade, like a movie studio, uh, you know, a link to the universal team that, shows up there for the Olympics, but meant to fool the world into believing that maybe what they had heard or read about uh, the Nazi regime wasn't true. You know, there were uh, commands for the German citizens in German and Nazi newspapers to smile, you know, to be friendly, to laugh, uh, to learn English, uh, to be hospitable hosts for all the uh, visitors that would be showing up, especially aimed at the U.S., um, understanding how important American public opinion was in the world at that time. And this is all, of course, to distract from the fact that a concentration camp has already been built um, about 15 miles uh, from the Olympics. I read an article about Joseph Goebbels in the New York Times that was written um, about a year ahead of the Olympics, uh, typical sort of personality profile, and it was positive. You know, um, it was a flattering article about Goebbels, surprising for me to read. And in the article, he talked about the fact that in his country, uh, the truth was irrelevant. And maybe that has some echoes today, but he said in his country that the truth was irrelevant. What mattered is did people do what you wanted them to? If they did, then, then what you said was good. Uh, if they didn't, then what you said uh, was bad. 
as uh, simple as that. And so I wrote in the book that the road to the Holocaust was paved with bullying, lies, propaganda, and a cynically calculated encouragement of, of intolerance. And that's the, the society that the world arrives at for this uh, event that's supposed to celebrate the, the best of humanity. Here's the basketball tournament itself. The first thing you notice is they played outside. Um, the Germans had promised that this would be, uh, you know, played under the fresh air and sunlight, and it would be a, a great thing. Um, you see the, the picture at the bottom. Uh, when the weather was good, it turned out pretty much fine. They played on clay tennis courts that had been converted uh, for the basketball tournament. You see that there weren't that many people there. You could easily walk up and stand in the front row at the first Olympic basketball games. Um, but the pictures at the top, I don't know if you can see, but it's, it's muddy. It rained, a uh, pouring rainstorm during the, the medal games at these Olympics. The U.S. was playing Canada. Naismith's, uh, he said it was the home of his birth versus the home of a country of his choice in the U.S. versus Canada in the gold medal game. And by the second half, the, the court was a total mess. The player said that when they tried to dribble, the ball would just get stuck in the mud. Uh, it was so waterlogged, it became very heavy. Um, the American players said it was really kind of a joke of a game. They just tried to play keep away in the second half to get the game over with. It was really disappointing to them because they wanted to show off. You know, they knew they were the best team in the world and they wanted to show off this game that really wasn't that popular in Europe yet um, and show uh, this exciting new game to the world, but didn't really get that chance in the gold medal game. The U.S. beat Canada 19 to eight, which was a really low scoring game even for those days. Uh, it was the last time that Canada has medaled in the Olympics. Mexico came in third, got the bronze medal. And again, it's the last time that they've medaled in the Olympics. Europe, of course, has become such a power in uh, international basketball uh, recently, but, but wasn't at that point. There were still teams then that um, only passed the ball over their heads, sort of like a soccer throw in. Um, and so the Americans breezed um, to the gold medal there and didn't uh, they won the gold medal every year in the Olympics until the controversial game in 1972 when the Olympics came back to Germany uh, in Munich. Now there was one member of the US team that stayed in Germany after the Olympics. His name was Frank Lubin. He came from the Hollywood team, from the Universal Pictures team. His parents were from Lithuania. And so the uh, some basketball or people who were interested in basketball in Lithuania invited Lubin to stay in Europe after the games, come to Lithuania and essentially be the James Naismith of Lithuania, teach the game there, introduce the game there. And he did. But before he went to Lithuania, he stayed in Berlin with his wife for a week vacation after the Olympics. And because he was the only player on the team to stay, he was the one that really saw the facade that had been constructed for the Olympics reemerge, uh, or, or sorry, the facade disappear and the real Berlin reemerge, Hitler's Berlin. He saw all the, the, the anti-Semitic posters go back up over town. He saw the signs prohibiting Jews from entering certain restaurants or sitting on park benches um, reemerge in Berlin, very similar to the uh, segregation uh, against uh, black people in the United States at that time. He saw these sort of first hints of what was uh, to come uh, in the Holocaust, six million um, Jews killed. And so as I was um, researching this book, of course I was research researching so much about the history of basketball, about James Naismith, about McPherson, Kansas, uh, about these players on the team, but also reading a lot about uh, these early days of Nazi Germany um, and the Holocaust and read so many of uh, Elie Wiesel's works and speeches you know, and one of the major themes uh, of his is, you know, he said, those who were kept silent yesterday will remain silent tomorrow. He was talking about uh, Germans in the aftermath of World War II and these uh, Nazis that were still walking the streets um, or people that had gone along with it still there, weren't speaking up now. You know, you can't count on people who have been on the wrong side of history to recognize that and to atone for it, basically saying that those of us, uh, who know the truth need to speak it now, right? He said he swore never to be silent whenever and wherever human beings endure suffering and humi humiliation, we must take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Um, that was really the same message that I learned in, in writing and learning about Perry Wallace's life. Um, 
who as a, a young African-American man playing basketball in the, in the deep South in the 1960s was concerned that he would be shot and killed on the basketball court and yet said that the most difficult part of his experience was on his own campus at Vanderbilt in his hometown where so many of the white students uh, remained neutral, did not speak up. His teammates and classmates who could have and should have seen that their teammate or their, their classmate was being treated unjustly and yet said that that wasn't their problem, you know, and refused to get involved. And he said that it was that sense of isolation and loneliness that was the most difficult part of his experience. Um, and so in the book I wrote, if the first casualty of Nazism was the truth, then we must tell the truth about the past, call out dangerous lies in our own time and raise alarms when we see justice or humanity imperiled. History has taught us we cannot be bystanders. Um, and I found a man uh, who represents sort of all of this coming together, um, Dr. Al Miller. He's now 98 years old, living in Cincinnati. The time of the Olympics, he was a 13 year old Jewish kid living in Berlin. He's the younger kid in the picture uh, that you see there. Big sports fan, played soccer at his school, remained in his school as the last, last Jewish student there, even after all of his Jewish friends had been bullied to the point that they left the school. His friends at, who remained at the school were joining the Hitler Youth. Dr. Miller, just at that age, 13-year-old kid, he just went to play soccer with his buddies. He attended the 36 Olympics. He told me he remembered riding his bike to the Olympic Stadium. The first uh, African-American person he said that he ever saw in his life was Jesse Owens, the fastest man in the world. He snuck into the Olympic Village so he could see all the athletes wearing their colorful sweatsuits. Um, the next year after the Olympics, when he's just 14 years old, his parents can sense what is happening uh, in their city and in their country. And they send Al away to try to save his life to the United States um, at age 14. He doesn't know if he'll ever see his, his parents again. His dad has two appendectomies that he doesn't even need as a way to stay in the hospital, to hide in the hospital for a month, recovering from these surgeries while his wife has moved out of their house and is trying to find fake passports. So the Nazis are looking for the Millers at their home. Dr. Miller's hiding in the hospital. The wife is hiding with friends, trying to find fake passports to get them out of the country. Eventually they're able to. And so they reunite with their son, Al, uh, in New York. He eventually moves to Cincinnati after the war. But during the war, he's old enough to enlist in the US Army. Because he speaks German, he's used to interrogate uh, Nazi prisoners. And then after the war, he becomes an eye doctor in Cincinnati, has this long career. In his retirement, he speaks to students twice a month in Cincinnati about these lessons from that period of history, lessons of the Holocaust. And I asked him, what do you tell these students when they ask you, how do we make sure nothing like this ever happens again? And he said that he tells the students that they already know the answer and that they've already spoken the answer out loud the first thing at school with their hand over their heart when they recited the Pledge of Allegiance. And he said the most important thing that we all have to remember is the last five words of the pledge, which are liberty and justice for all, not for some people, but for all people. And that we've seen throughout history what happens when one group says that, you know, they're the only ones entitled to certain freedom and justice and other people are inherently uh, unworthy of that. It always leads to hatred, always leads to incredible violence and in that we must remember that today. And so I was so um, just thrilled to find someone that could tie the whole story together, who was there in Berlin talking about what it was like to be a, a teenager watching the rise of Hitler, who went to the Olympics and is still here today in this environment that we're living through right now to tell us what the lessons are from that period that are so. Um, you know, obviously connected. And so that's how uh, the book ends with, with Dr. Miller. And so uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to talk to everybody. I know uh, that you have, well, maybe you don't have too much to do on a Friday night during a pandemic, but it's Friday night. You chose to tune in to this. It means a lot to me. Thank you. And uh, with whatever time we have left, I would love to answer uh, any questions that anyone has. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, 
I had the pleasure of reading your book and um, it's obvious that you have given, um, talked a lot about this book. It's near and dear to your heart. And I do want to recommend that um, even though it's for young adults and, and maybe that's my best reading level, but it, <laughs> it is uh, a book that is, is so moving and you tell this story so well, I felt like, you know, the way you write is the way you speak. And if people liked what they heard tonight, they should definitely buy the book and share it with others. Also, this uh, program will be archived. Okay, so, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, I was curious to know if Richard uh, Reuter, was he Jewish? Um, yes, he was. Um, yeah. He was from Ohio. Um, he spent time in Germany uh, and what he was arrested for was just taking notes about what was happening over there. And um, it was a jealous lover that had turned him in. Um, and uh, he was released. You know, I say he was Jewish. I think he was. I don't know that 100 percent. I think he was. I think the reason that he was released was because the Olympics were about to come up and, and the Germans uh, didn't want that sort of as a story. And so they, they freed him. He thought he was going to be executed, comes mm -hmm. back to Ohio, but then makes the point of going to New York to be there on the dock uh, the day that the Olympic team was moving. And, you know, that scene has been written about in other books, not Reuter, but that scene at the pier. You know, there's a number of books about the um, 36 Olympics, um, but no one had written about that protester before. And I thought that he was the most interesting part of the whole scene. You know, yeah. that in the midst of all this celebration, he was there telling the truth and was essentially ignored or considered, you know, the crazy guy with the sign uh, at the pier, but told so much uh, about the times uh, himself. True moral courage. Yeah. Yes. Um, we have a question. Have you researched uh, John McClendon? Yes, I have. Um, and John McClendon appears in the book and he has a connection to Nashville also uh, as a coach at Tennessee State, the HBCU here. But he was a black student at Kansas who was sort of a disciple of Naismith before black uh, uh, students were allowed to play on the basketball team at Kansas when it was still a segregated team. Uh, he still um, uh, befriended Naismith. Naismith. Naismith taught him a lot about the game and then McClendon became one of the greatest coaches uh, in college basketball history, credited with inventing um, so many pieces of basketball that we take for granted now. And I know that he's been celebrated and recognized by a lot of people here during um, Black History Month, but certainly one of the, the most important coaches in basketball history is a Kansas graduate who wasn't allowed to play on the team at Kansas. Um, another question, during the depression, my uncle was paid to play for the University of Akron where he was not a student. After that, he played for the Civilian Conservation Corps teams throughout the US. Can you go into college paying players in the 1930s? <laughs> Good question. I mean, you, you can in the 2020s, right? <laughs> a lot of schools, unfortunately. Um, the rules were very lax back then. I, I mean, you weren't supposed to, but it was happening for sure. That's one thing I wrote about in the book about Perry Wallace also is that one of the reasons he chose Vanderbilt is because they didn't offer to pay him. You know, and oh. if Jesse's on the, the Zoom tonight, she can vouch for this. This is a, uh, a family that played by the book, you know, and Perry was really turned off by the cheating that was presented to him at so many of the universities in the 1960s. Um, and it wasn't anything new in the 60s either. So I don't doubt that uh, this person's relative would have been uh, paid somehow to play in the 30s. I think Adolph Rupp was, was doing that at Kansas at the, or at Kentucky at the time, the Kansas graduate. Um, but, you know, the NCAA rules were, weren't really as sophisticated uh, as they were now either. Um, and even these AAU players that represented the U.S. on the Olympic team, and of course, amateurism was such a big uh, uh, focus then, they were considered amateur basketball players because they weren't technically paid to play basketball at the Globe Refinery in McPherson or the movie studio in Hollywood. But the only reason they had jobs at the refinery or at the studio yeah. was because they were six, eight, <laughs> they could be on the <laughs> basketball team, you know? So it was, it was uh, a sneaky way around the amateur rules at the time. Well, and they fit the Frankenstein costume better. That's that right, way, that's yeah. right. <laughs> um, how many teams uh, were there uh, playing in the Olympics? How many teams uh, played? There were, I think 30, 
won 32, 32 teams entered, 31 played because the Spanish Civil War broke out on the eve of the Olympics. <laughs> And the Spanish team had to go home. <laughs> so the U.S. won. We won our first game by forfeit because Spain wasn't there. Um, so even though this was a new sport at the Olympics, there were more teams playing in the basketball tournament at the Olympics than any other team sport at those Olympics. So um, Naismith was really proud. He, he said it was the proudest moment of his life to see his invention, you know, that started this little gym in Massachusetts and here 32 countries from around the world were there to play. Funny thing about Naismith arriving in Berlin for the Olympics, he thought that they might sort of honor the guy that invented the game. He showed up and he was locked out of the tournament because he didn't have tickets. Um, he had to buy tickets to see his own sport played at the Olympics because Avery Brundage was a little bit, I think, jealous of Naismith's attention he was getting and struck him from the guest pass list at the game. And so, um, the Olympic officials were uh, embarrassed by this and they sort of created a mini opening ceremonies uh, in Naismith's honor where all the countries paraded past him, presented him with flags. Naismith came back with a, a, with a, a swastika with a, a Nazi flag that he kept for his whole life. And that was auctioned uh, recently uh, at an auction. I'm glad you told that story because I, I giggled when I read that in your book. Yes. Um, <laughs> in your research, uh, were you able to find any descendants of the 36 team of the members? Yes, of the team? I was. So, you know, unlike the great luxury I had in writing the book about Perry, where I interviewed Perry for eight years as I was working on that book, um, I, I couldn't interview any of the players. They had all passed away. Dr. Miller was the only person I found that really had been at those Olympics, but I did find um, sons and daughters. Uh, of the players and, so, and they had all kept the medals. I was able to hold gold medals uh, from those Olympics, um, look at pictures that their parents had brought back, uh, in some cases read letters. Uh, there was one player on the team that we, I haven't mentioned, his name was Sam Balter. He was on the universal team and he was Jewish. So he was the only Jewish American to win a gold medal at the Olympics. He was a member of that basketball team and his daughter, uh, interviewed her dad about his experience there and wrote a book about him, his whole career, but the Olympic, uh, mm -hmm. you know, experience was a big part of it. And so I was able to learn some from, from her and from, uh, from her book as well. But I came to um, Kansas, outside of Kansas City uh, in Kansas to interview a couple of, uh, a son and a daughter of Olympians uh, for the book. Well, if you talk to them again, could you put a plug in that the Kansas Museum of History would welcome a donation of anything from that a team from McPherson? I'm sure McPherson would, you know, argue that they would like it better, but. Uh, right, and I should mention in terms of museums, I know that um, you've each got your own museum, but museums were so helpful in this research process. The uh, Basketball Hall of Fame in Springfield, the museum there, the museum at Springfield College, and then most helpful was the McPherson Museum itself, which does have a great exhibit uh, about the uh, refiners and the 36 Olympics and Brett Whiteneck there was really helpful in connecting me to these descendants of the players. Mm -hmm. You answered the next question that was up about whether there was a museum at McPherson. So um, yes. <laughs> yeah. there is a museum there. I uh, recommend they visit your museum and that museum. I don't know what the COVID rules are at that museum now. Um, Brett might be on this Zoom uh, and he could enter it in the chat, but uh, it's a nice museum with a great exhibit about the team. And then also they have the gym that these guys played in, that the refiners played in is there. It's restored beautifully. Uh, and they've recently put up a sculpture honor, honoring the team as well. And so, you know, if you're near McPherson, I would definitely recommend a visit. Great. Um, was the 36 Olympics the only time basketball was played outdoors in the Olympics? Uh, yes, it was. It didn't go well you know, with, the, yeah. with the rain. Um, you know, there wasn't another Olympics until 1948 after World War II. Uh, those Olympics were in London. Uh, they were played inside then and, and forever after. Uh, the, the London, uh, the American team at the 48 Olympics had the first um, black player. So, you know, I mentioned that the team was segregated in 36, um, integrated for the first time in 48. And then it was in 76 Olympics that for the first time there were more black players on the team than white players. Took a while. Yes. And the 76 Olympics I should mention is the first time that women's basketball was played in the Olympics. 
even oh. though women were playing from the very beginning, yeah. you know, when Naismith invented the game, his own wife was one of the first women basketball players. Um, but uh, 36 for men, 76 for women. And the book that I'm researching right now is on that women's basketball team that played uh, in the 76 Olympics. I was going to ask you what your next book is. Yes. So my next book is actually not that one. I have one coming out in just a few weeks. Um, I've already written it. Uh, just waiting for it to officially come out on March 2nd. It's called Singled Out. It's a biography of Glenn Burke, who was the first openly gay Major League Baseball player. And he also invented the high five. Uh, he played for the Dodgers and the A's in the late 70s, uh, died of AIDS in the mid 90s. Again, this is considered a, a young adult book for high school students, but written in a way that will appeal to adults as well. I'm really excited about it. Um, and then I'm researching this book, which will be called Inaugural Ballers on the first um, women's Olympic basketball team in 76. That will come out the end of next year, end of 2022, which is the 50th anniversary of Title IX, which mm -hmm. had such an important impact on women's athletics. Are you trying to beat your dad's record of 10 books? Is that it? <laughs> I don't know. He started a little earlier in life than I did. Um, but he's writing a book right now on Jim Thorpe. Uh, I know he's about probably halfway through oh. writing it. Uh, I've got a long way to go, but we'll see. Uh, more questions. What role, if any, did Fog Allen um, have after, what role, if any, did Fog Allen after the U.S. team was formed? So what was his role? Okay. Yeah, well, Kansas played in this tournament um, to try to qualify to represent the U.S. in the Olympics, but they were beat, you know, so they, uh, I think he had hoped that he would be the coach of the team if the Jayhawks could win the qualifying tournament or at least advance to the championship game. Um, his most important role was as the um, president of the U.S. Basketball Coaches Association or National Association of Basketball Coaches. He started what was called the Pennies for Naismith campaign. He felt that his mentor should be there, you know, to see his invention played at the Olympics. And he started a fundraising drive all over the country, games at every level of basketball, junior high, high school, college. Uh, and during the Depression, again, fans were asked to contribute even a penny um, to raise enough money to send Naismith and his wife to Berlin for the Olympics. Naismith's wife, Maude, had a heart attack. And... Naismith went anyway. Like, I don't think that would go over very well in my family, you know, but um, she stayed behind to recuperate uh, with a, a, a son or daughter in Dallas. Naismith went anyway, wrote letters back, you know. I she guess maybe changed she got a the locks on the doors, but, you know, I'm sure it went well afterwards. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Fog Allen wasn't there in Germany. Naismith was. Allen remained really involved with international basketball, though, you know, uh, for the rest of his life. And was involved with the Olympic team, but he, he didn't have an official role at the 36 Olympics. Okay. Um, we did get an update from Brett uh, Wetnack. Yes, the mm -hmm. McPherson Museum is open Monday through Friday, 8 to 12 and 1 to 5, and also on Saturday, 11 to 5. So right. shout out to you. All right. A um, couple more questions, if you have the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because of your extensive experience, are you surprised at the number of people today who deny the Holocaust? Who deny the Holocaust? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I, I don't know if I'm surprised. It's so disappointing, you know, um, and especially as someone that, you know, targets uh, middle school and high school kids with these books, you know, and seeing surveys where showing, the, you know, how uh, unaware young people are uh, either of the Holocaust or the significance or the extent of the murders in the Holocaust. But, you know, in my own experience, when I visit schools, you know, I don't really see that. Um, I mean, they're, they're still learning, but it's certainly being taught. I know the librarians are recommending good books um, about it. Students are interested in it. Um, I mean, I think that's one reason my publisher, I pitched them several ideas for this when this book was written, this was the one they wanted. And I think it's because there is interest, you know, in that time period. And, and I know there's interest in basketball, you know, so bringing those two things together. But um, I mean, this whole idea of denying reality, <laughs> denying the truth right now, um, we see it everywhere. So I guess I shouldn't be surprised by it, but uh, incredibly disappointed and dangerous. You know, mm -hmm. cliche to say that if you don't <laughs> learn history, you'll repeat it. But um, I think that 
there's a lot, and we were talking about this before we went on the air, but the connections between the United States and Germany, even in these years leading to the Holocaust and the, the segregation here, not being all that different than what was happening in Germany, you know, prior to World War II, uh, the fact that the um, Germans sent attorneys to American law schools south to study, they're looking for the most racist laws in the world and they found them here, you know, and that's how they, um, in part, how they developed the Nuremberg laws was based on what they had learned in the United States uh, in segregation and immigration and, and um, you know, inter interracial marriage laws uh, in the mm -hmm. United States. And so I think it's really important for young people, uh, adults to recognize um, that own history here in the United States um, and the sort of elements of, of fascism that we've had here in our own country that maybe we want to say it was just over there uh, in Germany. Well, and you know, as you pointed out, the one um, Al, I can't remember his last name, but the man yeah. who's 92, you know, these people aren't going to be around much longer. We're losing that generation um, very quickly and uh, the story keepers or, you yes, know, yes. making it real. And so that, that's why I think your book is so powerful and so important for young people, because uh, it's a very readable, very connected, approachable way mm -hmm. to, to learn this rather difficult, really difficult story. Right. And that's one reason that my books all involve sports is, I mean, I'm interested in it personally, but I also think it's sort of an accessible way into these uh, more significant subjects, you know, whether it's racism or fascism or anti-Semitism, homophobia in this book that comes out in March or uh, sexism in the book that will come out next year. If you see a kid sees a basketball player on the cover, like, well, that, that looks like might be fine, you know, or that won't be uh, too hard to read, right? You know, um, and so I think it, it works in a way, you know, they pick it up thinking it's just about basketball and then they get a lot more. But back to your comment about Dr. Miller, it is, um, and the same thing is happening with a lot of the civil rights leaders in the United States who, are, you know, their days are uh, numbered, you know, and so so powerful to hear from these people that were that lived it you know um, but one thing that Elie Wiesel said is that when you listen to a witness you become a witness yourself you know mm -hmm. and that's what he would tell the people that were studying under him and so they might not have had the same experiences that, that he had but if they really listened and learned to what he had to say then it sort of became their responsibility to pass that down to the other generations um, and so again Dr. Miller speaking directly to these students. I hope that they, that they, um, you know, sort of internalize that and take that with them throughout their lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, still more questions. Okay. Um, did the 36, um, the players in the 36 Olympics mind alternating squads for the Olympic basketball game? Cause well, I'll let you answer. I know right. what the answer is, but yeah, so <laughs> it's your program. <laughs> The quick answer is yes, they did mind it. Um, they combined these two teams, right? So they had 14 players on the team. Teams typically back in those days only had seven or eight players. So there were um, 14 players on the team. They didn't really realize until they were on the boat to Germany that they weren't going to be allowed to have 14 players dressed out for every game. They could only have seven. And so they had to divide up the team in half and they did alternate games. It wasn't literally just the Kansas guys in one game and the California guys in the other game, they crossed over a couple players from each team to the other, but it was primarily one or the other. The um, team from California had actually won the championship game in the U.S. qualifying tournament. So they were the American champions. It was a bit of an upset. The McPherson team was probably better, but so they felt that they deserved to play in the gold medal game the LA guys did because they had won the American championship, but the way the alternating games worked out because of the forfeit with Spain, it threw off the alternating. So the most of the players from Kansas were the ones that were able to play in the gold medal game. And they were the only ones that were invited to the medal ceremony. Oh, wow. So the other, the players, the American champions from Hollywood didn't even get to line up to get their gold medals at the Olympics. They didn't get their medals until they got back to the United States. They had to wait for the mail to come <laughs> delivering their gold medals. They weren't even invited to go watch the medal ceremony. Um, Sam Balter uh, said in, in his daughter's book that he and his buddy were just playing cards at the Olympic Village. They had nothing to do. 
So they went down to Olympic Stadium to see what was going on. And they saw the Kansas guys up there getting their gold medals. Um, so there was a bit of tension between those two teams and certainly between the two coaches um, there at the Olympics. Um, but, you know, they all got gold medals in the end. Yeah, but it could have been a real chilly boat ride home, I think. <laughs> yeah, it probably was. Uh, do you meet with college basketball teams and what is their reaction to your books? Yes. You know, um, with both of these books I have, uh, especially with Strong Inside, my book about Perry Wallace, uh, I visit with the Vanderbilt basketball team every year. Uh, the University of Wisconsin uh, has had me come up twice, speak to their team. Uh, Belmont uh, University here in Nashville as well. Uh, Arkansas Razorbacks um, have, uh, when I spoke at the Raven Bookstore in Lawrence, Fog Allen's uh, granddaughter <laughs> was there. I didn't get to speak to the Jayhawks, but she was there. So that was cool. And, you know, um, it's a really nice reception from the, from the players. It's typically before practice um, that I'll get to go in the locker room and, and talk to them. And I think, you know, if you follow the news, athletes are very socially uh, conscious these mm -hmm. days. And so they're attracted to that element of the story, uh, especially with, with Perry Wallace and the way that he spoke out uh, about the racism that he encountered as a college basketball player. And they're, they're interested in just what the, the struggles were like for him. Uh, with this book, they're just sort of curious about this being the first Olympic basketball team, you know, mm -hmm. and how different it was from what we think of Olympic basketball now. But I love the chance to talk to, to college athletes. And one of my favorite experiences at middle school and high school level is when there's a kid that the librarian will say, you know, loves sports, but really doesn't spend much time in the library. And when they say that they liked the book, you know, and that's yeah, what these books hopefully are all about is creating readers uh, from kids who maybe didn't consider themselves readers before. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's the end of our questions. Um, I right, well, do not get paid to promote your book, but I will say, I think everyone should go out and buy a copy. Um, and, uh, I'm go and also the one about uh, Perry Wallace. And we look forward to having you back to talk about your other books in the future. Um, thank you. Thank you yes, so it, much. Well, this my daughter's about to walk in the room here. <laughs> you better be worrying, my daughter's walking in the room here, but um, I wanted to say that uh, in terms of, you've got some great bookstores in Kansas and Raven and Lawrence was really uh, wonderful. And also Watermark uh, in Wichita uh, have been big supporters of Games of Deception. And I really appreciate that. You were great. Well, we'll be carrying them in our bookstore as well once we Thank finally you. open. <laughs> Here's Eliza. She wants to say hi to everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Your dad did really well. You can be proud of him. <laughs> I'm proud of her. Well, thank you, Mary. I appreciate this opportunity. Well, it was my pleasure. And um, thank you so much. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed tonight's presentation and we'll log in again next month on Friday, March 12th for a presentation by Dr. Nicola, Nicola, excuse me, Nicola, on the history of the Czechs in Kansas and elsewhere in the Midwest. He will be presenting from a place much farther away than Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> He's actually speaking from Prague in the Czech Republic. So uh, hopefully the internet will work well. And he is our first international Museum After Hours speaker. Uh, the museum is still closed, unfortunately, but there are tremendous resources for history buffs and teachers on our website, and I hope you will take advantage of them. And from all of us at the Museum After Hours, I'd like just to say good night and stay warm.